Hello. If you have your Bibles and you would, turn with me to 1 John chapter 1. We're going to read through verses 1 through 4. This is going to be an expository or a commentary on 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. So, starting at verse 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and shew unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Now, apparently... uh, what I read from one of the commentators is that, I guess in the Greek, that these four verses are kind of like one sentence or one thought, okay? And we have them separated into four different verses, and that can be what can cause some confusion as the context and stuff in here. Uh, there's lots of different views uh, on different phrases and stuff in these verses, and um, so it took me a while to kind of whittle them down to see which ones I thought were right. And a lot of the different views from the different commentators, you know, they're not really heretical. They could be. Uh, so that's why it took me a while to to determine for myself which ones I thought were right, because I could see possible that, you know, I could see the different ideas as all being possible. Anyways, let's go. Um, and also, I want to do, uh, so this is kind of like the first section of this chapter, and I also want to kind of break down these chapters as I do these expositories, because they can be lengthy videos. And I have eight pages of notes printed out just for these four verses. And, you know, I don't want to make all these videos to an hour or two hours long, just rambling on about this, and then, you know, people, you don't take as much from it. So I, I realize that kind of shorter videos are better. And anyway, so the first verse, um, and we and this section is called the Word of Life and the E Sword. These first four verses. Uh, so the first verse, First John one, says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the Word of Life. Okay, and so, and and um. And a lot of these verses in First John, we see instances where uh, there's evidence that the Apostle uh, John is the author of the epistle. Um, so, we see at the beginning here that there's language used that John would use respecting the Lord. Uh, you know, he's called the Word of Life. But also uh, the phrase, the beginning, you know, we see that in, in John chapter 1, verse 1, the Gospel of John. Um, and so this is ap- ap- applicable to the Lord Jesus. It's unique to John and the writings of the New Testament. And the language here may be regretted as a proof that this epistle was written by him. For it is uh, an expression that he would use, okay? And um, and basically, uh, this commentator says that if somebody was going to try to impersonate John, they would probably use his name to uh, to try to use his authority to claim his authority. And so, um, you know, we don't see that this was written by the Apostle John. So that's why we have these these evidences in the verses. We can see that it was written by him because similar things that he's used in the gospel. Um, and so anyways, you know, we see the term, the phrase in the beginning, or from the beginning, uh, John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And so, but when we start this verse, we start with that which was from the beginning. And so, uh, that which is in the neuter, um, this arises a lot of different interpretations right off the bat. This first, this first word, this first phrase here, um, because it's in the neuter, it's not it doesn't say him, which was from the beginning. So then there's speculation of you know is this speaking of 
you know, Jesus uh, from the beginning, from eternity. And there's also other interpretations. Um, somebody, I think that Albert Barnes thinks that it's speaking of the evidences of Christ. Um, and then he kind of changes what the beginning means. So there's different things, ways that people have looked at it. A lot of people would say that it's speaking of um, the Lord, which was from the beginning. And um, I found something that I kind of agree with. It's just a short... Uh, comment on it, and it says that uh, John employs the neuter as the most comprehensive expression to cover the attributes, words, and works of the word and the life manifested in the flesh. So the phrase, that which, um, is kind of like all-encompassing, comprehensive expression of the person of the Son of God, the divine person, the attributes, the words, the works, all of that's kind of included, okay? So we got that which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. Um, so we have from the beginning, and as I said, different interpretations on what that which means changes your interpretation of what from the beginning means. But I see from the beginning to mean from eternity. Um, it says from the beginning, not began to be, okay? But was essentially before he was manifested. But was essentially before he was manifested. First John 1, 2, answering, First uh, John chapter 1, verse 2, it's answering to him that is from the beginning which is said in 1 John chapter 2, verse 13, in the next chapter. It says, Him that is from the beginning. There's no question of what it's speaking of in that verse. Um, and so, this is also referencing to that. We see in John chapter 1, verse 1, which I already read, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we see that kind of same term used from John in the Gospel. And it's speaking of the Lord, and it's speaking of eternity past. And uh, we also see in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 23, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. And that proverb is speaking of the wisdom of the Lord, but we also know that that is applicable to the Lord Jesus. It's uh, wisdom personified. And Jesus is the wisdom of the Lord. Um... So continuing on, I believe that this is speaking of the Lord Jesus, um, but this is also encompassing, you know, his words, because it says uh, that which was from the beginning, okay, the, the divine person, which was from the beginning, from eternity past, which we have heard, okay, um, he heard of him, he heard his words, and he's seen him, he's seen his body, he's seen the acts, the miracles that the Lord uh, did on the earth. Okay, so, which we have heard, which we have seen, looked upon, handled. Uh, with all these, these words, um, these clauses, there's a climax. Uh, seeing is more than hearing and beholding, which requires time, is more than seeing, which may be momentary, while handling is more than all. Okay, um, so he's building stronger and stronger evidence that, you know, um, this proves him to be truly and really man, speaking of the Lord. Uh, for when the word was made flesh and dwelt among men, the apostles heard and saw and handled him. So this speaks of the humanity of Christ. So we have, we have the deity and the humanity because that which was from the beginning, speaking of eternity past, we're talking about the divine person. Okay, yet he was manifested and he was heard. And he was seen. He was looked upon and he was handled. So he was truly man, truly God and truly man. So, which we have heard. John was with the Savior through the whole of his ministry, and he has recorded more that the Savior said than any of the other evangelists. It is on what he said of himself that he grounds much of the evidence that he was the Son of God. They often hear him speak himself, okay, the, the disciples, the apostles, the people who were around uh, during Jesus' time, 
They heard him speak himself, both in private conversation with them and in his public ministry. They heard his many excellent discourses on the mount and elsewhere, and those that were particularly delivered to them a little before his death, and blessed were they on this account. We read in Matthew chapter 13, verse 16, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Which we have seen with our eyes. And I also think that, you know, there's spiritual application to that verse too, uh, but sure there could be physical application too, that they heard is that they heard him and seen him. Uh, but I think there's spiritual application there. Which we have seen with our eyes, that is pertaining to his person and to what he did. I have seen him, seen what he was as a man and how he appeared on earth, and I have seen whatever there was in his works to indicate his character and origin, his glory as revealed in the transfiguration, and in his miracles, and his passion and death in a real body of flesh and blood. John professes here to have seen enough in this respect to furnish evidence that he was the Son of God. It is not hearsay on which he relies, but he had the testimony of his own eyes in the case. And now we have, which we have looked upon, and this seems like, you know, he said, uh, we have seen with our eyes, and he says, we have looked upon. It seems kind of almost like the same idea. But this is more than to see. To see may be but a transient sudden act, but to look upon is a fixed and deliberate act, and usually a pleasing and delightful act. We looked upon him as the rarest object, as the desire and the delight of our eyes, as a wondrous spectacle, steadfastly, deeply, and contemplatively. This is appropriate to John's contemplative character. So that's another instance where we can see that this uh, epistle was authored by the Apostle John. He is a contemplative character. The additional idea which is couched in this word seems to be that of desire or pleasure, that is, that he looked upon it with desire or satisfaction, or with the pleasure which one beholds a beloved object. There was an intense and earnest gaze as we behold one whom we have desired to see, or when one goes out purposely to look on an object, the evidences of the incarnation of the Son of God had been subjected to such an intense and earnest gaze. And lastly, he says that our hands have handled. That is, the evidence that he was a man was subjected to the sense of touch. It was not merely that he had been seen by the eye, for then it might be pretended that this was a mere appearance assumed without reality, or what occurred might have been a mere optical illusion, but the evidence that he appeared in the flesh was subjected to more senses than one, to the fact that his voice was heard, that he was seen with the eyes, that the most intense scrutiny had been employed, and lastly, that he had been actually touched and handled, showing that it could not have been a mere appearance and assumed form, but that it was a reality. This kind of proof that the Son of God had appeared in the flesh, or that he was truly and properly a man, is repeated, is repeatedly referred into the New Testament. As Peter did when Jesus caught him by the hand on the water, when he was just ready to sink, and as the, this apostle did, John, when he leaned on his bosom, and as Thomas did, even after his resurrection, when he thrust his hand into his side, and as all the apostles were called upon to see and handle him, we read in Luke chapter 24, verse 39, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for his spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. There is evident allusion here to the opinion which early prevailed, uh, that the Son of God did not truly become a man. So, so him, him in saying all these evidences, he's refuting, you know, any beliefs that that um, Jesus wasn't truly God in the flesh. Okay. Um, and then lastly, here we have of the word of life. Okay. The verse is that which was from the beginning, uh, the divine person which we have heard, his words, which we have seen, his miracles, his bodies, we've looked upon, we've handled of the word of life. Okay, so this was a very interesting too when I just did a run through. Some different thoughts that I had on this phrase, the word of life. 
And so it says, of the word of life, so it means respecting to or pertaining to the word of life, concerning the word of life. Um, so some render it word of life lowercase w, word of life, meaning the message or the gospel. As we see the only other time the phrase is used in Philippians chapter one verse six or two verse sixteen, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And so that seems to be speaking of the gospel or so, but not in this sense, not in the, the context of first John chapter one. Verse one. So, however, word of life, meaning Jesus Christ, is far better. John spoke of hearing, seeing, and even touching, which makes it necessary for us to thank of Jesus. He is termed the Word in John chapter one verse one, and the Life in John chapter one verse four. And so now I want to give a. Uh, an interesting commentary that I read on the term, the Word. Why is Jesus called the Word? The name Word is most excellently given to our Savior, for it expresses his nature in one more than in any others. Therefore, St. John, when he names the person in the Trinity, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, chooses rather to call him Word than Son. For word is a phrase more communicable than Son. Son hath only reference to the Father that begot him. But word may refer to him that conceives it, to him that speaks it, to that which is spoken by it, to the voice that it is clad in, and to the effects it raises in him that hears it. So Christ, as he is the word, not only refers to his Father that begot him, but from whom he comes forth, but to, and, to, and from whom he comes forth, but to all the creatures that were made by him, to the flesh that he took to clothe him, and to the doctrine he brought and taught, and which lives yet in the hearts of all them that obediently do hear it. He it is that is this word, and any other prophet or preacher, he is but a voice. In Luke chapter 3, verse 4. Uh, you know, like John the Baptist, the voice in the wilderness. Word is an inward conception of the mind, and voice is but a sign of intention. St. John was but a sign, a voice, not worthy to untie the shoe latchet of this word. Christ is the inner conception in the bosom of his Father, and that is properly, is properly the word. And yet the word is the intention uttered forth as well as conceived within, for Christ was no less the word in the womb of the virgin or in the cradle of the manger or on the altar of the cross than he was in the beginning in the bosom of the Father. For as the intention departs not from the mind when the word is uttered, so Christ, proceeding from the Father by eternal generation, and after here by birth and incarnation, remains still in him and with him in essence, as the intention which is conceived and born in the mind, remains still with it and in it, though the word be spoken. He is therefore rightly called the word, both by his coming from and yet remaining still in the Father. And so we see that a lot more can be expressed and understood by calling Jesus the Word than just by calling him the Son. Uh, so there's a lot in that thought. And there's also different ideas and stuff that could be added to that. And also he's called the Life. He is the living Word of God, who with the Father and the Spirit is the fountain of life to all creatures, particularly of spiritual and eternal life, the word in which life resided, or which was the source and fountain of life. That is who Jesus is, the word in which life resided, the word of life. In John chapter 1, verse 4, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Similar to the title, uh, or, okay, so the word, the title "Word of Life" is similar to the title "The God of Glory." Okay, it has it includes the simple title of God, and then uh, you know it has one of its attributes: God is glorious. Okay, and so the Word, Jesus, the Lord Jesus, is life. So He is the Word of Life. 
And so if we're going to sum up this whole verse, it's kind of a paraphrase that I got here to kind of understand this verse. Uh, that is, whatever there was pertaining to the word of life, which was from the beginning, in his speech and actions, of which the senses could take cognizance, and which would furnish the evidence that he was truly incarnate, that we have declared unto you. Okay, that's basically the whole idea here. And so let's continue on to the next verse. So the first verse was a doozy. There was a whole lot there, a lot more that could be broken down and then examined. But let's continue on to the second verse. Now this verse is a parenthetical verse. For the life was manifested... And we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. So, this verse is parenthetical, as I said, and, and there's other verses uh, that John does that are parenthetical too. So this is kind of another evidence of the authorship of the Apostle John. In John chapter 1, verse 14, we see, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And then in parentheses we have, And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, and then full of grace and truth. John interrupts himself with this parenthesis to guard us against supposing that for a, for a moment that his material phrases overlook the true eternal spiritual nature of Christ. So that's one commentator's view of you know why this is why he adds this in parentheses because he talks so much about he talks about how you know he heard the words of the Lord, he's seen him, he's touched him and um so he adds this to um, further emphasize the fact that Christ was divine, not just a man. And reiterating the assurance of the reality of the manifestation, the apostle heaps assurance upon assurance with elaborate emphasis. Okay, for the life was manifested. So the life was manifested... It was made manifest or visible unto us. He who was the life was made known to people by the incarnation. He appeared among people so that they could see him and hear him, though originally with God and dwelling with him. John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Yet he came forth and appeared among people. He is the great source of all life, and he appeared on earth. And we, have, we had an opportunity of seeing and knowing what he was. Okay, the apostles did. And we have seen it. This repetition or turning over of thought is designed to express the idea with emphasis and as much in the manner of John. And we see that in John chapter 1, uh, verse 1 through 3, where uh, he repeats himself, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and um, the Word was in the beginning with God, or however that goes. Uh, he repeats himself basically for emphasis. And, you know, that's another evidence of his authorship. He was particularly desirous of impressing on them the thought that he had been a personal witness of what the Savior was, having had every opportunity of knowing it from long and familiar contact with him. And he says that we bear witness, we testify in regard to it. John was satisfied with his own character uh, he was satisfied that his own character was known to be such that credit would be given to what he said. He felt that he was known to be a man of truth, and hence he never doubts the, that faith would be put in all his statements. And we see some of this in, other, in John's other writings. We see in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verse 24, it says, This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. He said, and then continuing on in this verse, and show unto you that eternal life, or the life which is eternal. That is, we declare unto you what that life was, what was the nature and rank of him who was that life, who was the life, and he, and how he appeared when on the earth. He here attributes, he attributes eternity to the Son of God, implying that he had always been with the Father. So this is basically saying that Jesus was eternal, okay? That eternal life, which was with the Father, speaking of the Lord, which was with the Father, always before the manifestation on the earth. See John 1.1, 1, 1, the Word was with God. This passage demonstrates the pre-existence 
of the Son of God and proves that he was eternal before he was manifested on earth. He had an existence to which the word life could be applied, and that was eternal. He is the author of eternal life to us. And was manifested to us in the flesh as a man. He who was the life appeared unto the people. Now let's continue on to the third verse of 1 John chapter 1. It says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. We announce it or we make it known unto you, referring either to what he proposes to say in this epistle or uh, what he's written in the gospel. Um, that ye may have fellowship with us. With us, the apostles. With us who actually saw him and conversed with him. That is, he wished that they might have the same belief and the same hope and the same joy which he himself had arising from the fact that that the Son of God had become incarnate and had appeared among people. To have fellowship means to have anything in common with others, to partake, it, to partake of it, to share it with them. And the idea here is that the Apostle wished that they might share with him all the peace and happiness which resulted from the fact that the Son of God had appeared in human form in behalf of man, on behalf of men. The object of the Apostle and what he wrote was that they might have the same views of the Savior which he had and partake in the same hope and joy. This is the true notion of fellowship and religion. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, with God the Father. That is, there was something in common with him and God, something of which he and God partook together or which they shared. This cannot, of course, mean that his nature was the same as that of God or that in all things he shared with God, or that in anything he was equal with God, but it means that he partook in some respects of the feelings, the views, the aims, the joys which God has. There was union and feeling and, and affection and desire and plan, and this was to him a source of joy. He had an attachment to the same things, loved the same truth, desired the same objects, was engaged in the same work, and the consciousness of this and the joy which attended it was what was meant by fellowship. And so the fellowship with Christians, which Christians have with God, relates to the following points. So here's a few ways in which we have fellowship with God. And it's not limited to this, but one is in the attachment to the same truths and the same objects. Love for the same principles and the same beings. Attachment to the same truths is a way that we have fellowship with God. And also, the same kind of happiness. Though not in the same degree, the happiness of God is found in holiness, truth, purity, justice, mercy, benevolence. The happiness of the Christian is of the same kind that God has, the same kind that angels have, the same kind that he will himself have in heaven. For the joy of heaven is only that which the Christian has now in the utmost capacity of the soul and freed from all that now interferes with it and prolonged to eternity. So, attachment to the same truths, we enjoy the same kind of happiness. We have employment or cooperation with God. It's the way that we have fellowship with God. There is a sphere in which God works alone and in which we can have no cooperation, no fellowship with Him and the work of creation and upholding all things and the government of the universe and the transmission of light from, from world to world and the return of the seasons, the rising and setting of the sun, the storms, the tides, the flight of the comet, we can have no joint agency, no cooperation with them. There God works alone. But there is also a large sphere in which he admits us graciously to a cooperation with him, in which unless we work, his agency will not be put forth. This is seen when the farmer sows his grain, when the surgeon binds up a wound. When we take the medicine which God has appointed as a means of restoration to health, so in the moral world... In our efforts to save our own souls and the souls of others, God graciously works with us. And unless we work, the object is, is not accomplished. This cooperation is referred to in such passages as these. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 says, We are laborers together with God. Mark chapter 16, verse 20 says, The Lord working with them. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 says, We then as workers together with him. And 3 John 
chapter 1, verse 8, says that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. In all such cases, while the efficiency, while the efficiency is of God, alike and exciting us to effort and the crowning effort and crowning the effort with success it is still true that if our efforts were not put forth the work would not be done in this department god would not work uh, by himself alone he would not secure the result by a miracle by direct communication with him, or direct communion with him and prayer and meditation and the ordinances of religion and all the ordinances of this, ultra Christians are sensible, and this constitutes no small part of their special joy. The nature of this and the happiness resulting from it is much of the same nature as the commun communion of friend with friend, of one mind with another kindred mind, that to which we owe no small part of our happiness in this world. Okay. The Christian will have fellowship with God and his God and Savior in heaven where we dwell with him in eternity so there are many different ways we have fellowship with god uh you know enjoying the same truths and uh the same happiness and and prayer and by working with them so it also talks about having fellowship with his son jesus christ that is, in like manner, there is much we have in common with the Savior in character and feeling and desire and spirit and plan. There is a union with Him in these things, and the consciousness of this gives peace and joy. There is a real union between, Christian, between Christ and His people, which lies in the foundation of this fellowship. Without this union, there can be no communion. But a union with Christ in these things, in character and feeling, is nothing more than the union which exists between any chief and his followers. And why the Apostle Paul and others should reckon this a great mystery is not easily comprehended. Okay, let's finish up with the final verse, verse 4. And it says, In these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. In these things we write unto you, these things respecting him who is manifested in the flesh, and respecting the results which flow from that that your joy may be full. This is almost the same language which the Savior used when addressing his disciples as he was about to leave them in John chapter 15, verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. And there can be little doubt that John had that declaration in remembrance when he uttered this remark. The sense here is that full and clear views of the Lord Jesus and the fellowship with him and with each other, which would follow from that, would be a source of happiness. Their joy would be complete if they had that, for their real happiness was to be found in their Savior. And the last word here, full, is where the emphasis of thought should be placed. Small or partial joy may be possible from many different sources, but the joy that can come from faith and the only divine Son of God is full, both in the sense of being complete in its extent and perfect in its quality. It will leave nothing that can reasonably be desired further by a firm believer. So, amen. Praise the Lord. Thank God we got through the first four verses in uh, the epistle of John, first epistle. And so there's a lot there. Uh, that which was from the beginning, uh, encompassing you know the person, uh, the divine person, and, and all his words and his actions that were you know made manifest in the incarnation. Um, we now know why he's called the Word of Life. Um, a lot of different evidences of the authorship of the Apostle John in this. And, uh, you know, it, it speaks of the eternity of God, of Christ, and, um, you know, that he was truly divine, truly man. It speaks of his divinity, his humanity, and, um, you know, the Apostle John wanted to make sure that, you know, he laid assurance upon assurance uh, that he actually heard Jesus, he actually touched him, he was there, saw him, and uh, he wanted there to be no doubt, you know, that what he was saying was true. 
So, it's a lot of good stuff there. And uh, I think it only gets more complex and more debate as we go on. But, so I was really interested in the study. Uh, I enjoyed it. So I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. And I'll say a quick prayer. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your son, Lord. Thank you so much um, for every day that we live and breathe, God, and that we are in you, that, that we have fellowship with you, Lord. Uh, let us continue to have fellowship with you and with each other to get to know you more, Lord. And uh, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So thank you for watching, and I hope that you'll stay tuned for the rest of this and more videos that will come out. Thank you. God bless.